up? Good morning to you. This is Tacky Tat. Today we are looking at another Mark Felton Productions video. This is the giant looming over London. The story of the Zeppelins and the multiple different kinds of new aircraft that are really starting to take shape and actually becoming a thing in the First World War. Because uh, up until this point, air warfare was unheard of. And now there's new advances and aviation have really kind of led the way for all these different kind of new technologies and with new technology means new toys for war uh, and again as always be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below for the original content creator go give mark the love and support that he well deserves and let me know your thoughts down in the comments below of what you think and let's get started <laughs> German giants over London. Ferdinand, Count von Zeppelin, was not only interested yeah, in the, the development Zeppelin. of lighter than air machines such as the airship series that bought. Because really the first major aerial attack was a Zeppelin. In fact, I think there was actually two of them. Um, where they flew across the English Channel or the Northern Sea. Um, forget what city they flew from, but. Yeah, and it, it was completely unheard of, and they just bombed the city, which is unfortunate for the citizenry, uh, as it always is in times of war. But yeah, it, it really kind of set a new precedent for warfare from this point forward. Or his name, but also in heavier than aircraft. The Zeppelin Starken R6 was the ultimate German bomber of World War I. In fact, it was not surpassed in size until the end of World War II. Well, yeah, in size, because, I mean, it's a giant balloon. The Zeppelin is huge <laughs> and dangerous. The concept was named Riesenflugzeug, or giant aircraft, commonly known as the R-Bomber program. The engineers came from the famous German company, Bosch. Zeppelin is a better name. Bosch. Various early designs entered German service from 1913 onwards, so getting cool. steadily bigger. The R6 was the culmination of this design evolution. The prototype was completed in 1916. Wow. Jeez, look at that that wingspan. That is that's nuts, dude. That's long. The biplane aircraft was truly colossal. 22.1 meters or 72 foot 6 inches long crazy. with a wingspan of 42.2 meters or just over 138 feet. Its gross yes. weight was 11,848 kilos, or just over 26,000 pounds, and it had a range of 800 kilometers, or nearly 500 miles, and an endurance of between 7 and 10 hours. Its service... That's pretty long, too, for such a huge plane, biplane. I mean, wow. And especially now with the advent of... I uh, forget what the te technology is called, but it's where you can shoot per through the propeller and not shoot the propeller off while you're shooting, because that actually shoots through the propeller blades. Ceiling was 4,320 meters, or 14,170 feet. But this is a bomber, so I mean. It had four direct drive engines in a tandem push-pull arrangement fully enclosed cockpit and a complex 18-wheeled undercarriage. Each aircraft cost 557,000 marks to manufacture. Which I'm not too familiar with my March to dollars comparison. Which was pretty expensive for the <laughs> time. Here we see film of a modified R6 known as the R14 which had an extra engine fitted in the nose and required hmm. an astounding 50-man ground crew to handle. Little wonder that compared with the more Jeez. numerous two-engined Goethe G4 bomber... Man, the Germans really were on top of their technology game. I mean, they invested a lot into their science points. Only 13 Zeppelin Starken R6s saw service before the 1918 armistice. The Goethe G4 had been bombing England since May 1917 with some success, though improved British anti-aircraft and fighter defences had forced the Germans to switch from day to night raids, reducing the Goethe's navigational... Yeah, but that really impacts accuracy. I mean, accuracy was already kind of dismal anyway at the time, 
Uh, but doing just changing it from day to night, uh, like almost makes it like you're just shooting in the dark, really. And bombing accuracy. Obviously. The Zeppelin Starken R6 could carry a much increased bomb load over the Goethe, up to 2,000 kilos or 4,300 pounds. That is four times the Goethe's capacity. Huh. The Goethe had a crew of three, whereas the Zeppelin Starken had an astounding crew of ten. Divided into wow. an aircraft commander, two pilots, two co-pilots, two radio operators, and a fuel attendant, and one mechanic in each engine nestle. Some of the wow, one mechanic in each engine nestle crew doubled up as gunners. The plane being armed with four 7.92 millimeter Parabellum MG14 machine guns. That's nuts. The first R6s entered frontline service in June 1917. The unit sent against England was Riesenflugzeug Abteilung 501, based at Ghent in Belgium, with the Ford Airfield at St. Denis Vestrum. And that's, I mean, it's just amazing, even just to get these shots, like, to actually find, like, the photographs of this and even some of the videos. I mean, that in of itself means you should go subscribe. <laughs> At any one time, RFA 501 had five of these gigantic aircraft available for raids on England, often made alongside the more mundane Goethe bombers. Huh. The Zeppelin Starken R6 and R14 bombers proved very difficult to combat as they repeatedly stood off fighter attacks after being intercepted over England. Yeah, I mean, it's like an aerial tank. Like, you can, you can shoot your, like, with your biplanes and weave around them and shoot at them, but I mean, they're just going to keep cooking. On the 28th of January 1918, an R6 no. flew across Essex and was intercepted by a Bristol fighter piloted by Lieutenant John Goodyear. Goodyear was driven off with a German machine gun bullet in his plane's engine and his fuel tanks riddled. The R6 oh, wow. then ran into part of the protective barrage balloon apron around London, but the cables did not apparently damage it and the plane carried on flying. Oh wow, it ran into the cables and it didn't damage it. It just kept going. I mean that that's a testament to its hardiness right there. It carried on and bombed Odom's print works in London, killing 37 people. Hmm. The next night, two R6s reached London. One was attacked by fighters and turned back near Tottenham. The other one was intercepted by Captain Arthur Dennis of No. 37 Squadron, based at Goldhanger near Malden in Essex. Flying a BE-12, he attacked one of the R6s at 12,000 feet, but was driven... See, and the BE-12s were pretty maneuverable, too. I mean, for the time. Like, that's... That really kind of gave you the best agility. Off the by air. the Germans' four machine guns, his fighter riddled with bullets. The R6 turned at Hartford and made for Brentford. It dropped its bombs in Richmond Deer Park, Brentford, Kew Bridge. See, and it sucks. Dropping bombs just on random towns sucks. Because, I mean, it, it's, that's probably, like, that town's probably not even, like, have troops in it, really. Or, like, it, if, it's, if they do, it's very, like, undermanned. And so, really, you're just bombing the citizenry road and on Chiswick, then left Britain via Hythe on the Kent coast. It had killed 10 people. A third R6 was driven off by anti-aircraft fire at Billericay in Essex. The R6s and R14s raided England 11 times between late September 1917 wow. and the armistice in 1918, dropping 27 tons of bombs. They attacked alone. It's a lot. It's a lot of bombs. I mean, and flying to their targets like, on moonlit nights and following directional bearings yeah. received from base by radio one and especially because they're doing night attacks so they're just they're just flying over dropping random bombs approximately where they think cities are and calling it good it's airborne they would then follow the river thames to london each sortie was a 550 kilometer or 340 mile round trip that lasted seven hours. The first blitz, the combined German aerial bombing campaign against Britain between 1915 and 1918, using Zeppelin airships, Gotha bombers, and the enormous Zeppelin Starken aircraft, 
killed 1,394 people and injured 3,349, with the greatest number of casualties in London. Material damage was significant, and war production did decrease. Yeah, and really that just that gets in the psychology and just like ingrained in the citizenry's like forward thinking of like we are under attack like and it, it it really turns up the crank for like volunteer conscriptions in the war um which britain definitely needed at this point but i mean it's it's uh Priest, it's just as the raids disrupted war work stops. The requirement to defend London and South East England from such attacks diverted large numbers of fighters, anti-aircraft guns and personnel from the Western Front. For example, 16 squadrons of the Royal Flying Corps were kept at home, but it did lead hmm. to the development of an integrated home defence system See, that, that served Britain well when the German Air Force returned to wreak destruction in 19... Now with that bat gunner, where like, you just hopefully you don't hit the tail. <laughs> Of your plane. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also support my channel at PayPal and Patreon. Yeah. And again, do the same thing. Go check out Mart's channel. He has some awesome footage. I don't know where he finds this footage, but it's it's sweet. And let me know your thoughts below of the Zeppelin. And should we bring the Zeppelin back, just for novelty? Let me know. And again, I will see you on the next one. Cheers.